Hello Internet, my name is Patrick and this is Fringeworthy, a show where I talk to you about weird magic decks. We started this week of videos by talking about a deck with lots of counters. Today we're ending with a deck with lots of counters, but of a different kind. That's right, bring out all your D6s. Hope you've played Shadowrun recently because it's time to talk about Wurza Dice Factory in Legacy. Wurza Dice Factory is a very interesting deck. It mana ramps in a weird way. We're going to be using Astral Cornucopia and Everflowing Chalice along with Surge Node and other ways to add charge counters to ramp our mana progressively more every turn. It's not uncommon to cast an Everflowing Chalice or Astral Cornucopia for no charge counters off the bat, knowing that we can add more in the future. One of the other ways we add charge counters is with Core Tapper. Ideally, we can tap it to add a few counters, but we can also sack it to add two more counters, thus making it essentially mana neutral. We're also running four Mox Opal and four Lotus Petal, something that the modern version of this deck can no longer do. Now, the main keys that make the deck work are Mystic Forge, Manifold Key, and, importantly, Paradox Engine. Now, Mystic Forge lets us play cards from the top of our deck, which, when most of our cards are colorless, is essentially a way of drawing more cards to cast them. Manifold Key can help us ramp mana one time a little bit quicker, and let us use our Mystic Forge more than once. But the creme de la creme is Paradox Engine. Every time we're casting a spell, we're untapping all of our artifacts, which means we get to add more charge counters onto those artifacts, which means we get to have more mana next time we tap. This leads to a runaway exponential growth in our mana. Some backup options here on ways to get through the deck is we've got a Temple Bell. Temple Bell is really good except against sort of hard control decks, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Time Sieve is one of the ways that we need to have in here to win the game, and Sorcerer's Spyglass is just a great artifact card that we can cast and make use of. Being able to shut down our opponent's abilities, or fetch lands even, is phenomenally important to gain some speed up on them. We're also running two Urzas, as the name of the deck might make you think. Making colorless card instructs with Urza is one of the ways that we win once we take an extra turn with Time Sieve, or just casting through our deck by paying 5 mana. Emery is a huge tool to this deck to gain some consistency. Usually we can cast Emery very cheap very early on, and fills up 4 artifacts, up to 4 artifacts in our yard that we can then recast. And with Emery, we'll be untapping it every time we cast something with Paradox Engine. And of course, we have Whir of Invention for when we need just that one piece in our deck that we can't quite seem to find. One of the other ways we're searching for specific cards in our deck is with Inventor's Fair. Inventor's Fair also, their first ability, really does a great job at helping stabilize your life total early on in the game when we're using a lot with Ancient Tomb. See that Synod is here because it is both an artifact and a land and gives us blue. We're also running Glimmer Void, since we do need to splash a little bit of black to be able to cast Time Sieve. Karn the Great Creator is our other Plan B victory condition. We do have Mycosynth Lattice in the sideboard, and a whole bunch of other great wishboard cards we'll talk about in a little bit. We're also running Ugin the Ineffable. This will help get us ramping quicker and faster by making our colorless spells cost less. Also, by plus one-ing, we have a pseudo way to draw cards, and his minus three ability lets us deal with other pesky permanents on the opposing side. We also run one basic island. Now the sideboard is a little bit complicated, so before we get to it, let's talk about some of our combos. With Paradox Engine, Emery, and Lotus Petal, we actually can get infinite mana and infinite untaps. The way this will work, is first, we cast Lotus Petal. This will untap things with Paradox Engine, but we don't quite care about that yet. We will sack, par we'll sack the Lotus Petal for some mana of some color. Then we can tap Emery to target Lotus Petal in our graveyard to be able to recast it for free. Casting it for free, we'll use Paradox Engine to untap Emery, and then we can sack the Lotus Petal again and repeat this whole process. Another way to do this is with two Mox Opals. Instead of sacking like we did with the, uh, with the Lotus Petals in the last example, the Mox Opals will destroy each other, well, one of them, due to the Legendary rule. This way, we can actually gain two mana per cycle. Another way to go mostly infinite 
is with Urza and any way to make four mana or more. We can actually tap Paradox Engine to get one blue mana with Urza. And if we've got four other artifacts or some Astral Cornucopias or Everflowing Chalice or anything of the like, we can repetitively use Urza's five mana ability to cast a random card from our deck. Yes, it is possible that we end up hitting some lands, but the odds of that are very slim. If we've got more than five mana, we can go off much sooner this way. Now, the sideboard. First, let's talk about some of our wishboard cards. We've of course got Mycosynth Lattice for the Mycosynth Lattice lock with Karn. We've got Manifold Key in case we need some pocket untaps, very specifically. We've got Mystic Forge since it is one of our pseudo card draw options and we may need it in a pinch. We've also got an extra Sorcerer's Spy Glass in case we need to bring that in with Karn. We've got a spare Paradox Engine because this allows us to have more of them. And we're running one of Urza's Blueprints, which believe it or not, is the cheapest artifact that says tap, draw a card. Some more traditional sideboard cards we have here is Chalice of the Void, which we can both wish for or bring in in the main deck. We've got Tormod's Crypt, of course, to deal with graveyard decks. And our other alternate win condition, Acorn Catapult. If all else fails, sure, we can give them 20 1-1 green squirrels, but also ping them for 20 damage at the same time. So this is one of my favorite win conditions to opt for once you've got the combo going. Some other good wishboard cards or other sideboard cards are Defense Grid and Ensnaring Bridge. Both of these will help lock down specific opposing decks. Now let's talk about a few matchups. So Rug Delver likes to play the fair game, and they're going to have lots of ways to interact with us. With Brazen Borrower and Force of Will, they'll be able to bounce our opponent, our permanents and counter our spells, respectively. Stifle is also a huge problem here, and could also come up against certain blue-red Delver variants. So watch out for those cards and play around them whenever you can. Since this is a deck that is a control deck, we definitely don't want our Temple Bells in here as letting them draw more removal or counter magic is not going to be something we want as we're comboing off. Sorcerer Spyglass is also not particularly effective against a lot of Rug Delver's threats, and we can slim and shave off one Lotus Petal in exchange for our full four Tormod's Crypts. This will allow us to reduce their threshold abilities, shrink their Tarmogoyfs and their Hooting Mandrill paying abilities, Basically, fighting them over the graveyard is one of the few things we can do other than try to combo off faster. Talking about a more traditional combo deck here like Storm, whether they be running Ant or Tess or some Echo of Eons build. Basically, we need to be watching out for Wishclaw Talisman, Past in Flames, Echo of Aeons, even Ad Nauseam. Those are the things we want to try and watch out for because once they have those, we're kind of out of luck. So our ways to fight against this are minimal. We'll definitely need to be bringing in our chalices. Luckily, since we have ways to add charge counters, we can actually tick up our chalice when we need to stick it on two to prevent some of their win conditions. Um, so we have a lot of flexibility there. We also want to bring in our Tormod scripts to deal with any sort of graveyard strategy they might be running since most storm decks now have passed in flames in some way or another. Again, we don't want to have Temple Bell in because if they're if they're drawing closer to their combo, it shortens our clock greatly. Sorcerer Spyglass is also good for locking down some of their mana, but not much more else than stopping Wishclaw Talismans, so that gets the pullout as well. And we can also shave off one to two Lotus Petals as need be. Now let's talk about a prison deck. Prison decks are weird, so if we're looking at Mono Red Stompio or Mono Red Prison, Trinisphere is going to be a huge problem, but not insurmountable. A lot of our a lot of times once we have our combo going, we can pay three mana for all of our spells because we're making way more than three mana. Blood Moon is the real problem though. And Magus of the Moon. Anything that makes our lands not tap for blue early on can really hinder our game plan. So we need to watch out for those. Chalice of the Void seems like it would be very useful against us, but isn't actually as useful as you think. A Chalice on Zero can prevent some of our infinite combo abilities, but not all of them, so it's very tough for them to completely lock us out. 
there's not really much of a board plan here, as Karn will be able to get us all of our important pieces to play against them in a timely fashion that it doesn't quite make sense boarding them in here. Well, that about wraps up this episode of Fringeworthy. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing so you know when I post new deck techs. You can leave some comments down below if you've got feedback for ideas on improving this deck or ideas for me to cover in future episodes. You can see past episodes over here or over somewhere on the screen. Who knows? I'm going to add that after I do this outro. Well, yeah, this outros are hard. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. I might just stick with that one. Uh...